Thanks, worship team. You always do a fantastic job leading us in the Lord's presence here. So I'm uh, starting to feel a little old. Um, it's not aches and pains. I'll explain, though. Margot and I, uh, it, it's, you've probably heard in previous sermons from me, we're pretty big fans of, of British television stuff, and a lot of that ends up on, uh, on PBS, Channel 13. And of course, if you watch PBS Channel 13, before every broadcast, the first thing comes up is, you know, uh, 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 some advertisements, and eventually, you know, they, they get around to the, the, big, the big ask, you know, after they hear that uh, this show has been made possible through the generous gift of Gertrude and Wilbur money bags, um, they, you're asked to, you know, and viewers like you, um, hey, hey, that's me. Uh, I have never given to PBS, but, you know, those things remind us of something, that this stuff doesn't come free. And PBS does a, a pretty good job of trying to raise the money they have. They do a lot of these concerts, you know, that they, special presentations. Uh, I used to see the ones with the uh, classical music, or uh, sometimes they've done Les Mis, you know, some other things like that. That's pretty cool. And then you can tell they're targeting old people. Uh, they have the, the doo-wop ones, and I won't ask you to raise your hands. You know, the 50s music, and then, and then they started to move into the folk music of the early 60s. I saw that and said, well, that's cool. That's my sister's music. But now it's getting personal. They're getting closer now into these late 60s kind of music, and I'm starting to think they consider me to be old. Uh, so it's starting to bother me a little bit here, but, you know, I'll, I think I'll get past it, you know. <clears throat> but we're aware of these uh, fundraising that goes on in our culture, you know. We've all been approached to buy a 50-50 a ticket for some Charity. Uh, by the way, I've always been told that if you actually win it, you're supposed to just give your 50% back to them. But uh, I, I, I'll leave that to any of you who have won and haven't done that. And I'll let you know the guilt weigh on you, and you can something about that. You know, Girl Scout cookies keep coming. I love those things. I buy them up. Um, I'd probably give you less money if it wasn't the cookies involved too. But those are great. We know about text message giving now, right? We get, uh, I made the mistake, oh, I don't know how many years ago, a good eight to 12 years ago of giving a very small donation to a political campaign. Uh, I am getting four or five a day. Anybody else on that list? They share, uh, I mean, wow, how do I get off this? So we're used to these appeals. It makes sense to us. And somehow uh, we, we just know that uh, appeals need to be made. But when it happens in church, ooh, what is it about that? We're used to it every place else, but here in church, it just, it just feels a little different. We just feel like, oh man, I don't know. Well, keep that in mind for a second as we open up the scriptures today. If you could, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you want to use the one in the pew, I think it's on page 1147. <clears throat> you know, in the last uh, two weeks ago, um, Pastor Chris gave us a great sermon on chapter 8, and I'm going to be looking at chapter 9 today, but I wanted to just kind of speak about a couple things that he brought up out of that, uh, in that um, he was telling the Corinthian church about the generous financial gift that they had promised, and that the Macedonian believers were following through on that as well. They got excited, and, and they were all going to give now towards this famine that was happening in Jerusalem. And Pastor Chris presented three questions and then made three statements or principles uh, that we could learn that was appropriate for those Corinthians 2,000 years ago and I think is appropriate for us here today. The first in chapter 8 again, we're at verse 1 to 9, it was, why should we give generously? And Chris pointed out that it's because God has been so generous to us, especially through the work of Christ. And Chris pointed out a first principle would be that generous, the generous grace of God generates generosity. And then the Apostle Paul went on to kind of ask the question, how much should we give? Now, Paul doesn't give an exact figure, but he points to a heart attitude that recognizes that everyone has the means to give something, some people more than others, but whether you're rich or poor, we all have the means to give. And that way, as we all give, all, um, everything gets done. And there's an equality, maybe not of the amount given, but of the participation. And Pastor Chris left us with this principle, that your excess is for others. 
You know, the money that we have available to give is going to help other people. It's not meant to just be internalized for ourselves. And once we've decided to give, the, the closing verses of the chapter tried to answer the question, to whom should we give? And the Apostle Paul described the great effort he was taking to establish trustworthy people who would take this money and make sure it got to Jerusalem and was used in the most appropriate way to meet the deep need that there was there. These were going to be zealous men who were sold out for the uh, cause of Christ and could be trusted to do the right thing with the money. And so Chris left us with principle three, that trustworthy leaders are zealous for your good and God's glory. So that chapter lays the basis, the foundation for what we'll be looking at today in chapter nine. And it was a fine sermon, so thanks, Chris, for, for getting us to this point. But it's time to dive into today's passage. So in, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1 to 3, we read this. There's no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints, for I know your eagerness to help, and I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, uh, you came to Achaia, where we were re- and were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I'm sending the brothers in order that your boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Now, this famine in Jerusalem has been going on for some time, and the, in the past year, the Corinthians said that they, they wanted to join in, count us in, we are going to give. Well, the time has now come to give. And Paul is reminding them of the pledge that they were making. Now, as we read these opening three verses, I I saw three kind of uh, yes buts that kind of jumped off the page for me. In verse one, Paul says, there's no reason to, to write, but he's writing to them anyways. And then in verse 2, he says, I know you're eager to give, and I'm confident about it, and I boasted about it to the Macedonians, but just in case, I'm sending some people to remind you so that you're actually going to be ready to give when the giving is needed. Now, the next verses, the next couple of verses give us a little more information. In verse 4 and 5, we, we read this. For if the Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given." Have you ever been in a situation where you felt obligated to give? Uh, Maybe other people around are whipping out their wallets. Do you remember that feeling of being just a little bit uncomfortable? You weren't prepared to give. You weren't sure you wanted to give, but gosh, everybody else is. How did that make you feel? Prior to coming to Montvale Church, Margot and I spent a number of years in another church that had the habit of doing pledging. Now, pledging is this idea that uh, annually, in the late fall, we would be given a form that asked us how much we intended to give in the following year. Now, this makes a lot of sense for some churches because it gives them this kind of figure to say, we're going to budget this much in the coming year because people have promised to give so much. Now, this was new for us. For decades, we had been faithfully giving, tithing, and we felt different somehow writing down a figure in advance. In the case of me being a small business owner at the time, uh, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to make next year, what was going to be that amount. There was some active faith involved to say I was going to give this. Now, the church would send out every, every quarter after the three-month period, they would send out a little report of how you're tracking. So after June would come the little computer printout that would say, you're, you're, are you tracking towards the 50% of what you said you were going to give? And in October, it would be 75%. And basically, they were prompting us, are you going to keep your pledge or not? 
And while I usually had the habit of giving twice a month, you know, there were occasions when you were on vacation, something happened, you're just running late getting to church. Has anybody ever had that feeling of running late coming to a church service? Okay. Uh, and you didn't grab the checkbook. You said, oh, you know, I didn't write the check, and, and I'm still old school. I like the idea of putting it into offering plate. Many of you give electronically, and that's great too. But, um, you know, so you missed, you missed a week. You missed a, a, a payment. It, it, it's no, no big deal. Well, this would come, and all of a sudden, they're giving you, on your face, you are now 4.1% behind your planned giving. Um, you know, I'm like, whoa, okay. Now, I want to tell you, it didn't bother me that much. I didn't, it didn't cause me some embarrassment. But I wonder what it would have been like had instead of receiving this kind of nameless piece of paper that was generated by a computer program and, and there was stuffed by one individual at the church who kept track of these things, and I'm guessing that she likely was more concerned about getting a paper cut, doing all these envelopes, than what I, you know, what the data was on my sheet. But I wonder if she had instead called me on the phone to remind me that I'm 4.1% behind. Or if it had been in person while I showed up at the church. Hey, by the way, Chet, you're 4.1% behind. I think I might have felt slightly different. Would it be possible that I would feel some pressure to give, some embarrassment about it, that, that my giving now and making this up, this thing, which was easy to do and happy to do, would all of a sudden take on a different feeling? I kind of get the sense that that's what's going on here. Then in writing to remind them, Paul is trying to save them this embarrassment. I mean, it says it in the passage, but that idea of being face-to-face with this would be more difficult and would change the giving and how they wanted to give, I think. So we move on to the next verses, which talks more about this. Moving past this reminder of the need in Jerusalem and their commitment to give towards this, I think Paul starts to drive us into the heart of the matter and our need to cultivate a generous heart. And he does this through an agricultural analogy. Verse verse 6 says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now, it would be tempting to read this verse as a formula to follow. That is to say, if I give more, I am guaranteeing myself of getting more. If I give more money, I will get even more wealthy. Does that sound just a slight bit selfish to any of you? You know, if that was our motivation to seek after giving more so that we would get more, I think there might be a problem with our heart attitude about giving. I think it's fair to say that if your motivation for giving is is this mechanical get-rich scheme, you should have concern. But I don't think that's what Paul intended with this analogy. While it's a fact that those who live a life of generosity are blessed by God, it would be a mistake to consider that the blessings are exclusively in the realm of financial wealth. The Bible is full of passages that speak about finding contentment before you seek after or in lieu of seeking after riches. The Apostle Paul said it himself in Philippians 4, 12 to 13, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. This analogy of sowing seed caught the attention of the great Protestant reformer John Calvin. He noted that when he was thinking of this this concept of spreading seed, that casting something onto the ground, that it's something, you're holding something in your hand, and now you've spread it out and you've released it. It's out of your control. You had it, now you don't have it. 
You have some, lots of something, and now you have less of it. There's something is gone. Most of the time when we think of dropping things onto the ground, we think, oh no. That's where refuge of those people that are not being ecologically friendly throw the stuff they're not interested in. Our sides of our roads are full of this stuff, right? If it goes on the ground, ground is a place of rot and decay. But seed doesn't work that way, does it? This seemingly dry, lifeless little product, little thing, doesn't act that way when it gets into ground. It accomplishes something far more profound. And fortunately, farmers know this, right? So to give you some perspective, I was wondering exactly what, what do we do with seed and wheat? So, you know, thank, thankfully, Google tells you all these good information, right? You know, if I had 100 pounds of wheat, I could make somewhere between 200 loaves of bread if I'm making good whole wheat bread, the kind we're supposed to be eating, and 300 loaves of bread if I'm making, oh, excuse me, reverse, 200 loaves of bread if it's Wonder Bread, and 300 loaves of bread if it's whole wheat bread, okay? Two to 300 loaves out of that 100 pounds of seed. But suppose we sow that wheat into the ground instead, and now instead of consuming it, we're going to plant it. Well, that 100 pounds of seed is what is used to, to seed one acre of farmland. And out of that one acre of farmland, there is produced about 2,400 pounds of wheat. So let's do the calculation here. There's a multiplication that takes place here. We have the choice between seeing ourselves have two to 300 pounds or two to 300 loaves of, of, of bread or sowing that and seeing 4,800 to 7,200 loaves of bread. There's a multiplication that takes place. I think that's at the heart of this analogy that Paul presents us with. We have to make our decision. Do we want to keep the stuff we have and limit it, or release the stuff we have these small gifts, and see them multiply. And Paul goes on in verse 7 and 9, and he says this, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound in you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Even though he's reminding them of their promise to give, Paul is not trying to be heavy-handed about this. He's not trying to force them. Rather, he's challenging them to deeply consider what their giving is going to do, the important role that they can play in being agents of God's grace and mercy to the people in Jerusalem. Now, this idea of deciding your heart is, is, is good. It's important because it's stating that this decision is not simply a thought experiment. Okay? This is not a cerebral thing. This is more passionate. It's an emotional thing. I know at times we, we, we want to rain on our emotions and let our mind make decisions for us, but I want to tell you that this is the opposite. This is one of those things where your emotions should drive your mind past what you think you should do. You've probably had an experience like this of some decision in your life where you just had that, what we might call the gut feeling about something, what you should do. And that's... That's good to, to think about that, that are some decisions, some things, some cautions are not sheerly about, sheerly about something that's come into our mind, but there's something deeper in a core. Translators of this passage in other languages 
frequently have to change the word heart that we see here, the cardia in the Greek. They have to change it into a different word to have it make sense in those cultures. And the word gut is used sometimes in these other cultures. So you're not deciding in your heart, you're deciding in your gut. I think Paul is convinced that if the Corinthians, or for that matter, all of us, really set our hearts on seeking God's perspective on giving, the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into that generous giving, and he's actually going to give us something to rejoice about it, to be cheerful about. And sometimes it's going to be something that's not going to, in your mind, make sense, but you're going to feel really good about it. Then Paul goes on, verse 10 to 11, he says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, Farmers go to a a grain merchant. They go there to purchase seed they need to sow in their fields. Paul says, when it comes to our understanding of giving and the understanding of what we have, that our grain merchant is God. But here's flipping it around. Rather than us going to buy things from him, God not only gives us the seed, but he gives us an abundance of seed an abundance that will increase or multiply everything we have and our needs. The seed God gives us is perfectly selected. It's the highest quality non-GMO seed that you can get out there. It produces a perfect plant, a high-yielding plant that no man has involved with, that, that has modified. It's a high-yielding plant of righteousness, and there's a huge quantity of it. Now, this this word righteousness simply is what God deems is right, doing the right thing. Paul is saying here, God gives us everything we need to expand or multiply what God sees as right for our world. The question is, Do we believe he has actually given us that? Do we have the seed? Do we have everything necessary to plant our fields for a harvest of righteousness? Now, I was surprised as as this statement came to my mind that it dates back to the 4th or 5th century AD. But perhaps you've heard this too. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Anybody ever heard that? Statement? I can't believe it goes back that far, but it makes sense. You see, it, it's, it's referring to the idea that the, we always have perspective about things. Comparing ourselves to others and deciding that we are, they are rich and we are poor is something that we most of the times do. I think we heard earlier uh, in this sermon series, Pastor Sam talked about, I think it was one of the Rockefellers that said, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little more. We compare. Most of the times we look at that and we're convinced that we're poor because we always will find someone out there who has more money in the bank than we do. But this concept of the land, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, is driving us towards the idea, like, don't stop, don't compare yourself to those around you. Just embrace the fact that you have something. During my time in the Navy Reserve, I was, uh, one of our deployments for the, you had to go do uh, 14, 17 days out on the ship, and we ended up in the Bahamas on an a overnight uh, port, port call, and uh, I think we're in the Grand Bahama Island, yeah, I know we were, just Nassau kind of area, and uh, I had Sunday off, I, I went to church, and I was the only white person in this all-black church, 
it was there. Uh, it, looked, it looked like it was going to have a Bible teaching and so forth. So I went. I went to, actually went to the Sunday school class. Uh, I sat there with a group of about a dozen people in a sanctuary much like this, circ- circling around talking, and then stayed for the service. And I was really impressed by what I saw there. I was enlivened by it. Because here in the midst of a people who I would say by, by earthly standards were far poorer than I was, there was great joy. There was great joy in the Lord. There was great joy in that service. Here are people living in a town which was, uh, you know, populated every time the cruise ships pull in and they've got all these multiple docks, they all pull in. The wealthy cruise people are all coming ashore and they're living in that environment of seeing great riches flood onto their shores and they're living in fairly humble circumstances and yet there's joy. These people did not consider themselves to be poor. I think that's one of the great benefits of some of these mission trips, including the one which some of our people will go on here in June. When we get ourselves out of our environment and see that people with seemingly, you know, much less than we have in poor situations can live as wealthy people, it has to impact who we are and what we deem as important and must-haves in our lives. So we move on to the next, the last verses of this passage here, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 12 to 15. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Paul is stating here that their giving to the need in Jerusalem will not merely meet the physical need of putting food on their table to fill their bellies, but it will actually meet a deeper spiritual need that the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem have. The generous giving of the Macedonians and now the Corinthians, uh, it's going to cause the believers in Jerusalem to turn their hearts and minds away from their present famine, their present situation, the dire circumstances they think they're in, and turn them towards God. The Corinthians' giving will cause thanksgiving to rise up to God. This concept of thanksgiving rising to God is something that Paul brings up numerous times and in, earlier in this book, he brings it really to bear as he talks about the, the, the way the gospel impacts people and raises up thanksgiving. It's one of those themes that he, he talks about us being like fragile clay jars in which this fantastic message of Christ has been put the surpassing power of God, the, the gospel is on display in our lives. As humble as we are, just these clay jars, something really great comes out of us. It's a power that changes lives. It, it changed Paul's life for sure. And it changes our life as we trust in Christ. And it changes others too as they come to know us and through us come to know Christ. Christ. You see, our our giving is not just our money. Our giving is a gift of ourselves and our relationship with God. And it's, it's an expression of how God's grace has transformed us. And therefore, God's grace becomes the gift we're giving away to others. In spite of all the hard things that Paul has experienced as he went around the Mediterranean basin sharing the gospel... In spite of his persecution, imprisonment, and all that, he thought it was all worth it because people's lives were being changed. One very influential pastor in my life early on, one, the church that I uh, left from to go to seminary, he, he had a favorite verse, and it's from 2 Corinthians 4.15. He said this, All this is for your benefit, 
so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. This has had great impact for me over the years too. Of course, thinking of him, but I've just seen it played out so frequently. As we experience God's grace and as we are able to share God's grace with others, it impacts them. It results in those people themselves coming to faith or glorifying God themselves. You're multiplying, much like the seed throw on the ground, you're multiplying thanksgiving rising to God. And while that's true as we share the gospel or verbal communication about the difference Christ can make in our life, I believe our generous giving, the generous giving of our lives and everything does the same thing. The more generous we are in the lives of other people, it is going to result in people giving thanks to God because of the gifts of generosity that we have used. So let me wrap up this, this morning telling this. I want to just leave you with this idea that generosity is not necessarily something that automatically comes to us. You know, we heard from Daniel today, he's reading a book, and I'm betting that any of us that read that book like Daniel, we might find that, oh, there's something I've learned about my giving. There's something I can grow in. I think we need to understand that it's a learned behavior. At minimum, it is this behavior that can improve over time. I think we see this obviously when we look at our own children. We think of them as we rear them. We teach them from a very young age to share their toys. Why do we do that? And we're trying to teach them what it means to be a generous person. I heard an example uh, much past the time when I was rearing my children of if your children get a present uh, at, at birthday... For every one that comes in the house, one needs to be donated out of the house. And I thought, man, what a great idea. Instead of this glut of things that build up in every house, I mean, it was in our house too, right? Instead of that glut that I see even in my own workshop, <laughs> more and more. Instead, we're giving away. Well, let me, let me give you four things that I think might be helpful for us about this idea of learning to be generous, okay? First, I want to say this is we learn from the saints before us here at Montville Church, okay? It's time for audience participation. Everybody, please stand if you're physically capable of standing. Go ahead. Go ahead and stand. This is a beautiful space, isn't it? Go ahead and just take a 360 degree turn and take it all in and note the things of beauty and a function that are in this space. Go ahead, go ahead and do it. <laughs> Folks, we are living on the generosity of those that have come before us. You can go ahead and be seated. The pews you just sat on are the result of the generosity of people in the 1960s here at Montvale Church. This was, the, as I understand it, the second part of their building process. The first was the original, over here, the original church. It's now church offices and classrooms and so forth like that. And then they, then they built this. It's my understanding, just to build the original building, the original things in here, people actually put up their own homes as a guarantee for the loan for the bank. That's a heart of generosity. The people that put up the money to put up these, these grand beams and the stained glass and everything that's in here was an act of generosity because they saw that they were going to reap benefits from this investment. This was not throwing seed onto the ground and having it rot, but they envisioned seed thrown onto the ground and producing a great increase. 20 times the loaves of bread of what they were sowing. 
Secondly, I think we can learn from around us from the generous acts of those around us right now. You know, it's tempting to notice the names on buildings at colleges and universities and places. People donate large money. They give so much, they, that happens. But the reality is, the anonymous gifts impact me much more. When I hear of someone giving a huge amount of money to someplace and there's no name attached to it, I say, how cool is that? That's a heart of Generosity. Folks, that's what happens here. You know, everything we're seeing here is because we anonymously are, are giving. We're connecting with that. All of us should kind of buy into that, be one of the anonymous givers around this place. And the reality is that the amount you give, which Pastor Chris mentioned last or two weeks ago, the amount you give is not matters, but that we are participating and we're here. The scriptures have those stories of, the, little, the widow's might, the woman who's praised by Jesus for the small amount she puts in compared to the pomp and circumstance of the, of the gift of others. Right now, there are people that are giving, you don't notice, but they're giving well. Follow the example. Learn to be a person that gives well. Thirdly, I think we can learn from forgetting about money to expand your generosity. Now, okay, I, 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 this kind of plays into something you've already heard and even Daniel mentioned today as he spoke, the idea here that uh, financial generosity is certainly very important, but I think to learn to be truly generous, you have to look even beyond that. I think you need to, to, to embrace this idea that time, talent, and treasure are involved here. Now, it sounds nice that we'll go, okay, I'll do time and talent, but I don't want to get involved with that treasure stuff. Okay, you're holding something back. But the flip side is also true. We should feel uncomfortable with just giving of our treasure, but not investing the other parts of us that God has given us. So I might challenge you to say, if you want to grow in your ability to be a generous and to be a generous giver, I want to ask you the question, how am I generously serving at church? How am I generously representing Christ in my neighborhood, at work, with my family, my extended family? I can guarantee you that there's some wonderful opportunities for you to be generous in serving at church, in all the different ministries that we have. Finally, a fourth point I'll make with you is learn by asking God, learn to be generous by asking God to give you a heart of generosity. This is the choosing to be generous idea that was the label of my sermon today. The pastor and Bible commentator Lloyd Ogilvie tells a really interesting story about a man named Lowell Berry. And Mr. Berry was in high school uh, when he came into this concept of, of giving. He heard a sermon that impacted him greatly. And it started him on a lifetime of giving. Mr. Berry said this, at the time I decided to give God a portion of all I earned, I didn't earn a thing. <laughs> it wasn't until I finished college that I earned any money. Lowell Berry went on to become a very successful fertilizer business owner in California and made large amounts of money. He also became the main or largest benefactor of Billy Graham's School of Evangelism in North Carolina. Uh, this guy was a part of Pastor Ogilvie's church, and in response to, to knowing this about him, Pastor Ogilvie said this, our conversation was a reminder to me that it's the decision and not the dollar that creates the giver. That's onto that. That's powerful. It's the decision and not the dollar that creates the giver. That's our opportunity, I think, today. If we wanted to get down to this, we, we, we have to, you know, decide to do this. It's certainly something that Margot and I decided to do way back in the 80s, long before I was a pastor. Much like uh, Mr. Berry here um, heard a sermon. 
and from one Sunday going from good old formal Catholic, formerly Catholic, give a little bit out of your wallet on Sunday, went to tithing the next week. Uh, and it was a joyful decision, and I haven't looked back on that. Now, the implications for this uh, are, are not insignificant. Other things in your life, when you decide to be this kind of giving, have to become secondary. Uh, you start to look at things in light of what God wants to do. It gives you uh, freedom to give to God and, and his work and let the other things be donated to by others. I don't feel any compulsion to give to PBS. Uh, that's someone else's calling. But my heart for giving for God's work is there. So perhaps today, the question for all of us to, to ask for reminding ourselves or asking for the first time is this, Lord, am I generous? Lord, am I generous? Ask others who could perhaps tell you the truth. You know, do you think of me as being a generous person? When you look at the way I interact with you, with others, do I exude generosity in my time and talent? And then internally you can ask the question, does that then play out in my generosity with my treasure? Let's pray. Lord, for these weeks we've been looking at this idea of generosity. And Lord, as we think that you walked into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, knowing what lay ahead for you, the pain and humiliation you would go through, that you did all that as our generous God who wanted to give us the most fantastic gift possible. As we recall all that, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to take the theme of these weeks of generosity and let them become uh, really deep in our heart. Lord, give us a heart of generosity, a heart that says, I offer myself to you, Lord, full bore, that my time would be something I use for the benefit of your glorification, that I would reach out and meet the needs of others around me in this church and in other places, ultimately knowing that great thanksgiving will rise to you as a response. Lord, that my talents will be used effectively in generous ways. And Lord, in our culture, it's so hard to not think about money and to be concerned about rising inflation rates and everything else, Lord, but could we have the peace of knowing that you are the one who provides our needs. And therefore, Lord, teach us to be generous even with our wealth. And in all these ways, Lord, we ask you to do these, that uh, we would honor you in every aspect of our life. And that as the grace that is reaching more and more will rise to thanksgiving to you. And I pray this in the name of our triumphant Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.